stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm story expert who is in control of her own power now, Lonnie Diane Rich. And I'm large and glowery film scholar Noelle LaCroix, and we're here today to talk about Pangs, the eighth episode of season four. Pangs aired on November 23rd, 1999. It was written by Jane Espenson and directed by Michael Lang. All right. As you know, as we know, as everyone knows who has been here with us all along, this is a fully spoiled podcast. If that's news to you, maybe get caught up on your Buffy, brush up on your angel, and then come back and join us because we will talk about anything and everything. I like my evil how I like my men. Evil. Straight up, black hat, tie you to the train tracks, soon my electro rave will destroy Metropolis bad. So let's go on patrol. In Pangs, Buffy's out patrolling and kills a vampire when she seems to sense someone watching her. There is someone watching her, of course. It's Angel. The next day, the school has a groundbreaking on a new anthropology building, and Xander is working on the construction crew, and Anya, Willow, and Buffy talk about how Thanksgiving is colonizer bullshit wrapped up in ritual sacrifice with pie. Xander starts to dig because, of course, the foundation of every building starts with one dude shoveling rather than, you know, an excavator, but fine. He falls through into a buried underground mission. That night, Angel lurks outside Buffy's dorm, and she seems to sense him but then switches her attention to Thanksgiving. Even though Joyce is out of town, she still wants to have the holiday. You know what? I should have my own Thanksgiving. I can cook the meal just like my mom does, have all you guys over, it'll be great. Outside, Spike is wandering through campus, destitute and starving, wearing a ragged blanket. Riley, Forrest, and Graham are on the hunt looking for Spike. Anya goes to Xander's basement. He's sick and can't go to work, so she takes care of him. In the mission, a green mist rises up and exits from the hole Xander fell through. In her office, the anthropology professor watches as the green smoke forms around an ancient knife. The smoke turns into a Native American man and he slices her throat. Later, Willow and Buffy break into the office to investigate and figure out a theory. We're just assuming someone else cut off the air. What if it was self-inflicted like Van Gogh? So she brutally stabbed herself dump the body and then cut off her own ear? Buffy goes to Giles's to prepare for their Thanksgiving dinner, and she's more interested in the pumpkin pie than the murder. She reports that the murder weapon was an old Chumash knife, then rushes out to the store to get more things. When she leaves, Angel steps out of Giles's bedroom and they talk about Doyle's vision that Buffy was in danger and the current threat. You know, I'm glad that you're watching out for her, but I feel I should remind you that she's not helpless and it's not your job to keep her safe. It's not yours anymore either. Are you gonna walk away? Starving and wrapped in a tattered blanket, Spike pulls a little match girl as he peers through a window as a bunch of vampires feed on a victim. Like a family. Outside, Buffy and Willow are passing by the coffee place when Riley comes over to talk to them. Willow steps away to give them privacy, and Angel pops out and tells Willow he's there to keep an eye on Buffy. Buffy goes to find Father Gabriel to discover him hanging from the rafters as Hoos, the Shumash vengeance spirit, attacks her. They fight, and he hits her, right in her white guilt. You slaughtered my people. Now you kill their spirit. This is a great day for you. As Buffy and Giles prep Thanksgiving dinner, they talk about Buffy's hesitation to kill Hoos, 
and the fact that they lack a ricer for the mashed potatoes. Buffy wants to stop Goose, but she doesn't want to, you know, hurt him. Willow comes in with books on what happened to the Chumash tribe and suggests redressing the wrongs done to the tribe. Giles disagrees, as it's not within their power to make anything better, and in the meantime, innocent people are dying now. Then there's a knock on the door. It's Xander, and he looks like death. Turns out, part of the Chumash vengeance is afflicting white people with the wrongs done to the tribe, including various European diseases. Well, they, they did suffer from malaria, some smallpox. I was going to say smallpox. You know. Syphilis, but basically standard sort of... Syphilis? At the Cultural Center, Hoos breaks into the exhibit and takes the Shumash weapons. Back at Giles' house, the debate rages on whether or not they should slay Hoos. Well, the representative from Syphilis votes yay. And as Buffy focuses on having the perfect Thanksgiving dinner, goddammit, there's another knock on the door, and there is Spike asking for help. I'm saying that Spike had a little trip to the vet, and now he doesn't chase the other puppies anymore. I can't bite anything. I can't even hit people. So you haven't murdered anybody lately? Let's be best pals. Meanwhile, Hoos is raising an army of vengeance spirits to take all the weapons and go out to get that vengeance. Buffy ties Spike to a chair and tries to work out her white guilt with Willow. Spike tells them that they need to shut up and deal. None of their whining will bring back all the people who were killed. And it's just annoying. And he's not wrong. Giles figures out that Hoos is targeting people of power, so Willow, Xander, and Anya go off to warn the Dean, who was the most powerful person at the groundbreaking. As they leave, Angel finds them to report that all the Shumash weapons are gone from the cultural center. They put their knowledge together and realize something. Why the Dean? Well, we think he's going after someone in charge, a leader? He's a warrior. To a warrior, the leader means the strongest fighter. Buffy. At Giles's, Hoos and his raiding party attack, shooting arrows through the window at all of them, although Spike takes most of the hits as Buffy and Giles hide behind the couch. Everyone else returns, and they all fight the warriors outside, where Buffy can't see Angel in the fight. Buffy stakes Hoos and realizes he can only be killed by his own weapon. He turns into a bear, and she manages to stab him with his knife. He and the entire raiding party vanish into green smoke. Later, everyone sits down to a yummy, if slightly guilty, Thanksgiving dinner. Well, maybe we started a new tradition this year. Maybe not. But at least we all worked together. It was like old times. Yeah, especially with Angel being here and everything. All right, so let's get this whole thing out of the way up top. Pangs is a very uncomfortable episode of Buffy, which is good. I think it should be uncomfortable, especially for those of us who are of the white people persuasion, the various privileged persuasions. Um, We have to get used to being uncomfortable with the history. We regularly benefit from racist systems that maybe we didn't perpetrate, but we still live within their effects, as do the people who were harmed by them. So Noelle and I, as two white women we need to tread a little carefully on this topic i think and we you know recognize that we also welcome the input of anyone who can broaden our perspectives hashtag still pretty but the argument at play here do we recognize and respond to the fact that this guy is killing people and dispatch of him like any murderous demon or do we think about the greater context and hesitate Um, And my personal feelings, again, I'm speaking just for me. I'm not speaking for Noelle. Noelle will speak up in just a minute and be able to speak for herself. (laughs) But what I'm saying right now is this. If someone's killing people, no matter what their reasons, you have to stop them. A bunch of white guilt about what was done wrong in the past doesn't help anyone. My white guilt doesn't find the missing indigenous women, nor does it get justice for the murdered indigenous women, which, by the way, if you haven't heard about that, that is a big thing. And there is a link in the show notes to give you some more information about that. Um, My white guilt also doesn't provide reparations to generations of black people whose families literally built this country through unpaid slave labor and have since been prevented from building generational wealth by racist systems. Uh, there's also going to be a link to ta Coates' reparations testimony to Congress. And here's the thing, people. I know reparations are controversial. Do not at me about this. I'm a fucking story expert. I am out of my lane and I know it. Just read the testimony, figure out where you stand and vote your conscience from there. I'm just saying it's something to think about. It's a topic that needs our attention. So anyway, 
my white guilt, my feeling so bad about all of these terrible things that were done that that benefit me to this day doesn't make it right. All that does is make me feel like maybe I'm less of a bad person, but that remains about me. This spirit's vengeful killing of innocent people doesn't right those wrongs. It doesn't unmurder or unrape the ancestors. So the spirit needs to be stopped. And the white guilt needs to be laid aside. It helps no one but the white person. And guilt about the past is not enough. You need to take action in the present. So in the name of Chipperish Media and the patrons who keep us going, I have donated to the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. That link will also be in the show notes for anyone else who has the ability or desire to donate and help them find and help the families of missing and murdered indigenous women, which has become an epidemic and an epidemic that is often ignored by our mainstream press. So all that said, I'm going to turn this over to Noelle, who can speak for herself. That's kind of where (laughs) I land on this whole big uncomfortable thing. But mostly I want to get this out of the way, kind of talk about it at the beginning, you know, give it the attention that it deserves. But I also want to talk about this episode as an episode. And I think that that if we talk about all of these social issues up front, then we can deal with the episode as an episode of Buffy. So, Noelle, let me just yeah. turn that over to you. You know, no pressure or whatever. <laughs> Great. No pressure. No pressure. Um, <laughs> yeah, I... Okay. This episode, I think, might be my beer bad, by which I mean it's oh. the episode that is... So, like, it's so, so terrible that I can't even... <laughs> Like, I can't find the enjoyment. There are there are some moments of delight for me, but I'm just like, no, I just want to stake the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and partly, I mean, partly it is the the social issue the you know, the issue of of settler tradition versus, mm-hmm. you know, the actual history of the Shumash people who are still here, by the way. The show acts like, you know, oh, they were, you know, they were wiped out a long time ago. No, they're they're still here and Mm -hmm. capable of telling their own stories and history. Thank you very much. I I mentioned when we talked about Beer Bad that I Mm -hmm. think people's, some people take issue with that episode in part because they don't like to see Buffy in this foolish state. Yes. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm here for Cave Slayer, but the Buffy right. who just wants a normal Thanksgiving, you guys, like I cannot. It's so whiny. It's so entitled. I just hate it. I don't want to watch it. And then you layer all of the white guilt and all of the gross. Ugh, I can't. I don't. I, I don't know. Um, but something I mean, and here's the thing. And this happens to me. All the time where I'm like, I hate this. I don't want to watch it. But they hit the symbolism and the theme hard in this Mm -hmm. episode, whether it was intentional or not. Mm -hmm. And I do feel, you know, before we get into like the writing and the story structure, because that shit is great. And I know Mm -hmm. you have a ton to say. um, I want to talk about this theme of white guilt, settler guilt Mm -hmm. versus, you know, this indigenous spirit through this. I don't know. I don't know how intentional this is, but mm-hmm. here we go. So, <laughs> so the, I mean, really, like I don't, and I know that there are things that I'm not seeing as mm-hmm. a white person, but here we go. Um, so we open with a boy walking through the woods, but oh no, it's a vampire. Mm-hmm. Here's the interesting thing. This, the way that this is set up, Buffy says, looking for me. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. He was minding his own damn business. He really was. You know, minding his own damn business as a vampire who was looking for somebody to kill. I mean, well, well, but but hold up. I mean, (laughs) and then he says, why don't you just go back where you came from? Things were great before you came. Oh, yeah. No, that's I, if, I, like, like my guess with Jane Espenson, who wrote this, is that <laughs> that was absolutely a deliberate punch to theme. Yes. <laughs> yes. So and then we get the groundbreaking on the Cultural Center, mm-hmm. which is so spectacularly edited. Um, yeah. I mean, writing wise, but also sound wise. Mm-hmm. When the, you know, when our head anthropologist in charge says melting pot, a car alarm goes off, <laughs> which I just love. 
I love that detail. And, yeah. you know, of course, we hear that Willow's mother doesn't celebrate Thanksgiving or Columbus Day. And, you know, yeah, like I'm yeah. with her on that. But also, you know, here's our straw feminist, Sheila, right. back to, you know, make make that kind of um, historical awareness seem right. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So I see what you did there, show. <laughs> 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 But then we get this fantastic line from Anya to commemorate a past event. You kill and eat an animal. It's a ritual yeah. sacrifice with pie. Which I but love. That lead, which is, I mean, my moments of delight are almost exclusively Anya in uh-huh. this episode. But mm-hmm. I love that that line leads into, and thus a symbolic beginning right. from, the, <laughs> from, the, from the, you know, the, mm-hmm. the speechifying up front. So... I mean, yeah, like, yeah, they know, they know Mm -hmm. that this is complex and maybe, maybe that they've bitten off a little bit more they could chew than, Mm -hmm. and that maybe they've bitten off a little bit more than they could chew within the scope of a 40 minute, 45 minute television show. Um, (laughs) But it gets, I mean, it gets, it gets real intense real quick when we Uh have white settlers beating native spirits with shovels saying, why won't you die? Right. Um, which is really, I think, what our what what our country, our mm-hmm. very white supremacist country, has been asking of the indigenous peoples oh since right. we Why got here. You just go away. Well, right? yeah. yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. when you write, well, and here's the thing: like, I can't decide, and really, I don't get to decide what is more problematic: right. writing a mm-hmm. story that assumes that this this nation is mm-hmm. gone when yeah. they are in fact still here the mm-hmm. shumash are still here or inventing a tribe native to sunnydale that mm-hmm. was white like i don't know what is more okay and maybe the okay thing is to just like like back off entirely and let native people tell their own damn stories mm-hmm. <laughs> where they get to you know where they get to um, shape themselves and the narrative. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But the best bit of symbolism in this episode, for my money, is Spike saying, You made a bear! Undo it! <laughs> Undo it! <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because, because really, in this scenario, Buffy has made a problem a million times mm-hmm. worse by <laughs> whining and being entitled uh, and, you know, like, like bypassing all of the, the conflict, all of the, the issues that are coming up. She's like, well, I've got to go, you know, got to go oh, base, yeah. got to go add more <laughs> condensed milk. So, uh, 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 I mean. All right. So here's you made the a thing. bear. <laughs> you made a bear. I... Love this episode. I so enjoy this episode. I understand the problems with this episode. um, But this episode to me feels more like about it's about white guilt and the uselessness of white guilt. um, When it doesn't help anybody. It just really white guilt is about the white people and it makes the white people feel better about themselves, which you know what nobody's interested in white people feeling better about themselves. Maybe we should feel a little bad. And then (laughs) Follow that up with some action. Like, I understand that I didn't come over here and, you know, kill people and do all these terrible things. But I am part of, I mean, good God, I'm half German. I'm half English. If I have, like, (laughs) ancestral guilt, like, Jesus, nobody should feel worse about themselves than me. Like, when you're talking about heritage, Jesus, you know. So, like, you take the action where you can, you do what you can. Um, and and taking actual action is is much better than, um, than just sitting there feeling guilty about it and saying, oh, but I feel guilty, so I'm a good person, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, no, my white guilt doesn't help anybody. So, to me, like, I'm actually okay with what they do in this episode because it is about the essential cultural solipsism of white guilt. 
And I think that it represents that pretty well. And the fact that the Shumash were not actually wiped out almost speaks in a metatextual way to exactly that in kind of a fun way. So I sort of I sort of dig it. But anyway, so I love it. And I love Buffy. I love her obsession with the normalcy of Thanksgiving in this. And I actually love the fact that I can love this thing enough for both of us. And it is OK. Hate on it all you want. I absolutely <laughs> support your perspective on that. And I see where you're coming from. I do see where you're coming from. Um, but I love it. Um, I love the way that 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 wanting of normalcy, that that desire for normalcy kind of contrasts with the topic, the evil in this particular episode in a way that is really, really fun. Not to mention the fact that I just delight in a protagonist with a strong, clear goal, even if and sometimes especially because it's not the goal related to the central narrative conflict. To me, it's just fun. The fact that like Buffy wants normalcy, she wants family, she wants connections, she wants that that ritual experience, which is a holiday is a ritual, like ritual is a huge part of like human human psychology and human um, community, you know, ritual is, is so incredibly powerful. And every holiday, what we do on the holidays, it's all ritual. It's repeated things that we do, ritual sacrifice with pie, right? Um, so Buffy really <laughs> desperately wants that normalcy. She wants that family connection. This is her family. You know, she is trying to yeah. create this experience. And yet the history of it and the reality of it um, conflict with everything that she wants from it, you know, and that I think is a real conflict. Now, Thanksgiving doesn't happen to be one of my favorite holidays. It's five, six, seven hours of cooking for like 20 minutes of eating and then you pass out. Not to mention the fact that like families fight on Thanksgiving. Like it's a whole big thing. Like Thanksgiving is a kind of a nightmare, like for everybody. Um, <laughs> aside from the cultural implications, it's just a nightmare in general. It's just a kind of a dumb holiday. Um, but the idea that we are celebrating this coming together of cultures, you know, with Thanksgiving when really what it was was the, the decimation of one culture by another. Um, and I think that there are definitely things to talk about with that. And I'm glad that this episode actually does talk about them. Um, but I find it delightful. I love Buffy's relationship to the normal, the desire to mark out a part of her life that is just going to be normal. And it's always interesting to see her struggle with that essential contradiction of her existence. You know, it explains her attraction to Riley, who she believes to be normal at first. You know, so, I mean, that's cool. Like, that's part of the reason why she likes him. Um, and in season six, when we hit the episode normal again, we're going to revisit this topic again, that she just can never be normal. That's the question. Can a slayer ever have any part of her life that's normal? And the show would seem to say no to that. No. Yeah, of course not. I mean, when you're extraordinary, there's not yeah. going to be. I mean, yeah, you're going to have little pockets of ordinary in your life. Mm -hmm. But no. No. No, although I do love something that this episode, I think, does perfectly is amping up the fighting of Thanksgiving. Yes. Because, <laughs> of course, they're all fighting. This is a family unit. You know, exactly. she, Buffy even tells them, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's going to be just like when I was a kid. And she tells Giles, you're the patriarch if you don't host. <laughs> like, it doesn't, you know, she's she's trying to orchestrate this whole family situation. Mm -hmm. And in a way, she's a lot more successful than she intends to be because they argue about religion and politics. They argue right. about identity. The, the, <laughs> there's there's a couple fight between yeah. Anya and Xander. It's yeah. That bit is fantastic. That depiction of... You know, their nor the normal that they get is mm -hmm. a whole lot of fighting amongst themselves. Yes. <laughs> um, and then with yeah. the holiday itself, in a mm -hmm. way, so mm -hmm. that that is extremely enjoyable. But and I I appreciate the concept of a protagonist with a goal that is completely out of step with the world <laughs> right. in which she's operating. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't enjoy this Buffy. I really oh, don't. Oh God. I freaking love it. <laughs> I love it with my whole goddamn heart. So speaking of normal, we've got this whole. Is that your freaking... ringtone? Oh my God. I thought I put this thing on do not disturb. Do you need to answer it? No, it's Clive. I can never remember how to reject a call on this thing. Oh my God. Oh my God. Answer it. Answer it. Put him on speakerphone. Seriously? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, fine. Hello? Loni, Loni, is that you? What do you want, Clive? What do I... I just escaped Bryony's evil clutches. She's had me handcuffed to a radiator in a Motel 6 for weeks. 
a Motel 6. Oh my God, look, I love a delusion as much as the next girl, but this is getting to be a bit much. I'm ending my contract with your agency right now and hiring someone else. Leave me alone. Wait, I'm going to need some popcorn for this. You still don't believe me? No, Clive, I don't believe you. Your work is unreliable. You're either a pathological liar or an unstable fantasist. And your accent? It's kind of crap. Oh my god, I am loving this. My accent? You don't believe I am genuinely British? Look, all I know is that you were here, and then you were gone, and the Patreon ads that I paid you for are not showing up on a regular schedule. For crying out... This episode of Still Pretty is brought to you by my dire peril. Oh god, Stop it, you drunk. Go to CliveHasBeenHeldCaptive.com and use the code HisGirlfriendDoesn'tCare to get your discount today. Wait, did he just call you his girlfriend? Look, dude, I can do the Patreon ask myself. I don't need you. Or instead, you can go to Patreon.com slash Chipperish oh and give your money directly to Chipperish Media God. so we can keep making the great what podcasts you, you love. doing? Like Still Dead about Angel the Series? Angel the Series. Listen up a about the Marvel Cinematic, Cinematic Universe. Universe. All guests about, about explosive inspiration. inspiration. Metaphors, Metaphors be with you about Star about Wars. Star Wars. And and how, how story, story works, works, a free college, a free college level, level course in narrative theory. theory. Go to patreon.com slash chippers and find out how you keep everything free and free. free and ad free. Wait, did you just call me your girlfriend? Uh, uh, well... I'm 48 years old, Clive. I'm never going to be anyone's fucking girlfriend ever again. Could we perhaps table this discussion for a time when I'm not on the run for my life? <sighs> Fine. I'll send you bus fare. We'll figure it out when you get here. Actually, I think I might prefer traveling via airline if that's not... (laughs) Okay, that was seriously the most fun I've had on a podcast in a while. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. I have got to start dating more boring men. Oh, Jesus. Well, speaking of boring men. All right. So, Riley, right? We know that he's a commando, right? And... I, what is the deal with the camouflage faces? They're basically <laughs> out on campus in military gear. I mean, if you want to blend on campus, get a pack of Marlboros and hold it to go coffee cup. What is that? <laughs> I love I, I have no idea what's up with the with the commando nighttime look. Right. But <laughs> I don't know. But I love Riley's interaction with Forrest. <laughs> About his mama's boy cough when right. Riley's talking about um, Professor Walsh and like wanting mm-hmm. to be on top of things for Walsh. And that's something that I don't think I got into last time is the Riley Walsh parallel to Buffy Giles that oh, right. they have a there's like a there's like a, a interesting professional mother son. Yeah, it's a, it's a very similar, similar yeah, relationship. They have a, similar dynamic so Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe that's all i had to say about that but (laughs) yeah no it's kind of an opposite number you know because we have gender flipped in the roles um and we also have maggie walsh as we are about to discover being like super fucking evil you know um so that's gonna be a thing i mean she owns it bitch monster of death you know what and she came out and said it right in the beginning like nobody was listening to her nobody was listening (laughs) but she you know it it was on the label in the beginning Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, but you know, back to Riley though, like this whole thing with Riley is he is this very like representation of normal, like quote unquote normal, capital N normal for Buffy. You know, he's going to Iowa for the holiday to live out an American painting version of Thanksgiving, you know, and that has that appeal to her and like her being drawn to normalcy and how Thanksgiving represents the mundane and the normal for her and family and community community and all of those things man I just I I can't help it I love it I love it well and I love this Riley who like pops out of nowhere but then reveals that oh actually he was across the street and down the block and like (laughs) sprinted (laughs) over I just I I love Riley with no chill like that's (laughs) Because he, he's so smitten in this, like, you see it, and Willow yeah. knows it, and of course she's grinning like a goddamn fool. Yeah. This interaction between Buffy and Riley, I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't do it for me, but Riley never really does it for me. Riley is, I mean, even at his best, he's boring. At his worst, he's an <laughs> asshole. But that usually, that doesn't really happen until, like, I think... Toward the end of this season and season five and like all of season five, he's a complete jerk. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know. Like Riley, I'm not sure if it's it's poison from future Riley that makes me. <laughs> but like in this, I'm like I don't care. Whenever Riley's on screen, I'm bored. I'm like, can we just move on from this? <laughs> who cares? Who cares about Riley? And I understand there are I, lots of people out there who care about Riley and love Riley, and that's okay. Noel is here for you. I love his face, okay? I love okay. his face, and I love his broad shoulders and his chest, and I'm sure his abs are very nice. Do we get shirtless <laughs> Riley soon? Because I I might need some shirtless okay. Riley. No, I, I, I like him. I like the way he represents normalcy. He gets super problematic. I mean, he's already mm-hmm. been pretty yeah. i mean is riley hell a little. feminist hell no hell no he's hell not no. is well, he really nice to look at yes <laughs> yes he is and ah. that's ah. where i i love that's, it that's where i that's where i come down on riley so to speak all right so you love 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 riley uh i don't but i love 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 giles i always love giles i love the moment where he's like i'm still trying to stop referring to you lot as bloody colonials i love his little i like mushy peas thing i love the quietly simmering sweater giles underneath the surface that moment after spike does his big speech and he says well i made a lot of these points earlier but fine no one listens to me like i freaking Love Giles. I love when Buffy tells him that sarcasm does or is no good or whatever. And he goes, well, it's really an end in itself. You know, I love Giles. I hate Giles in this episode. <laughs> I hate Giles. Oh, I love so it. Hard. Between you and me, everybody who is listening to this should feel pretty seen. Go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> There's somebody out there who's like, I don't see what the big deal is. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just like, like super, super meh on everything. Yeah. Um, and okay, Giles. Ugh. I get <laughs> that like symbolically we're doing like the bad dad thing with this like, right. you know, everyone calm down and listen to me thing that he's doing. But this is where I really get to see my own bias as in. Mm-hmm. The guy with the British accent must be right and also mm-hmm. kind of hot. And I'm like, wait, no. I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> fuck you, Giles. Giles is like, oh, yeah, we're going to help the angry spirit with his rape and pillage and murder. And I'm like, OK, first of all, no one said anything about rape and pillage. There was no rape. Yes, Giles. there was no rape and pillage. There was there was murder, though. Fair there enough. Murder. There was murder. murder. There's so he's one third right. Yeah. <laughs> And but also, like, a, yeah. a, like a, a white British guy talking about rape and pillage. Like, yeah, I can see yeah. step back, maybe. Yeah, yeah, like, like, like step scan, outside of that glass house. Stand there. down, <laughs> you know, the inherited like, glass house. Yeah, come on, Giles. But like, this is where I'm like, okay, wait a second. I need to like decolonize my desire because mm-hmm. this whole like the British accent is sexy thing is, I mean, is not unique to me. <laughs> no. But I'm like, I know. Hold on. Like, why is it okay when Giles is an asshat just because he's got the, the, the air quotes, sexy British accent? And I'm like, hell no. Hell no. I mean, <laughs> no, yeah, like, okay. All right. All right. But here's the thing. Like, right up to Giles's confusion about the anthropologist yeah. and the priest. I'm like, yeah. seriously? Like, those seemed like the most obvious choices to me. Yeah. And it suggests that Giles really isn't. Like, he's like, oh, I'm the level-headed one or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, we need to be level. I do love I love um, Willow uh, telling him that his, she has the level head and his is the head that things would roll off of. I know. It's so cute. But he's like, he's like, it doesn't make any sense. What's going on? I'm like, you're really not thinking about yeah. the angles here. Like, you really are in this, like, you know, British okay, imperialist, you know, you know British imperialist hat, like, firmly on head because... <laughs> You know, it's Giles. I mean, like, okay, like, here's the thing. I get the decolonize your desire thing. I am going to say, like, I clearly have a weakness for British men. Wesley, Giles, Spike, like, I'm not going to lie. I love the accent. I think that's great. Then again, I like almost all accents, like almost all of them pretty much. So <laughs> so that's a, that's a me thing. I like a man who sounds different, right? That's fun. Um, but, the like, variety yes, is think, the spice of life. I'll give you is, that. It is. It is. It's if, very, very fun. It's And very if you're fun. Kinsey Zero and you're stuck with men, I see how one wanting variety in the yeah. sounds your man may whatever it's fun. exactly whatever. have some sympathy for me and my cis head straightness right um <laughs> <laughs> oh god it must be so hard it must it be is, so hard to be so, a cis white so woman 
thank you so much for understanding how difficult this is, Noelle. No, but I mean, you know, yeah, being stuck with men sometimes. But anyway, um, we'll have we'll have that discussion off mic. But long story short, um, I I love um, I love Giles, and I believe that I love Giles not because of a colonized desire, although I will definitely take a look at that. That is an interesting angle on my my deep deep love of British men. It's an interesting thing to look at. I will absolutely think about that. Um, but like Giles in and of himself, like I just love. And Giles also, I because I see this emergence of depressed sweater Giles, like coming out, like his sense of his own uselessness. And I think when you get in your own head about that stuff, that's when you start to like screw stuff up and miss details. Um, so I can kind of see that with Giles. I forgive Giles. I forgive him. <laughs> But again, like, yeah, I'll look at my own motivations. Noelle, I appreciate you opening up my eyes to that. I think that that's very valuable. I will take that to my therapist. Um, but speaking of therapy, here we've got Angel. Actually, that's not a segue. There's no therapy with Angel. I'm just I'm just doing what I can, right, to get us moving forward. <laughs> we you, just, you we got to move this along. Got, I will talk s- about Giles all day. Don't think that I won't. Give me those well, British men, man. <laughs> well, and I mean, and Giles being like, I do like Giles as the dad who's just annoyed mm-hmm. with everyone. But, yes. you know, like, <laughs> like, uh, why are we doing this at my house? You know, like, <laughs> I get the sense that Giles was very much roped into this whole Thanksgiving thing. Does oh, yeah. not want. Oh, absolutely. Like, he would just as soon take this long weekend alone to, right. like, listen to his records or whatever. And. Not yeah, he says with, it's just to yeah. stick him with the cleanup, and then Buffy just kind of barrels it's past like, that, which is funny, yeah. which means that's absolutely what it is. Um, but it's very, <laughs> very sweet. But anyway, so Angel, right? We get a little bit of Angel in this. We get the crossover, which will go into the episode, I Will Remember You, over in Angel. And if you haven't seen I Will Remember You, oh my God, go watch it. It tears me into little pieces every time I watch it. Um, But I'm not going to think about that right now. But this is Angel (laughs) lurking around. He's watching Buffy. Buffy can sense him. We see these moments throughout where she's like, huh, something's weird, you know. Um, Giles stepping in for Buffy is interesting, right? When Giles says, it's not fair, you know, that's what she would say, right? That seems Mm -hmm. like an oddly empathetic in her shoes as a woman kind of thing for him to say, you know? Um, But I liked that he was speaking, you know, because Buffy wasn't able to speak for herself in that circumstance because everybody was keeping this information from her, which is also something I don't quite buy. I don't quite buy that Willow would not immediately tell Buffy about Riley. I don't quite buy that Willow would not immediately tell Buffy about Angel. I don't quite buy that Giles wouldn't tell Buffy about Angel. Everybody is aligning themselves with with the wishes of the men as opposed Mm -hmm. to like, you know, and so Giles, maybe if he felt like it was keeping Buffy safer to not be distracted by Angel, maybe Uh, Willow. I don't, I just, I don't know. I I don't know. In my like relationships, like whoever I have the primary relationship with, like that's the one that I'm going to be loyal to. And if Riley, if Mark Blucas comes to me tomorrow, Noel and says, (laughs) I have such a crush on Noel, right? (laughs) My response Mark Lucas is, is be, happily married on a farm somewhere with a beautiful Instagram family, but whatever, it's fine. I should, no, this is a hypothetical. <laughs> this is let's live in this world for a minute, right? <laughs> if he came to me and said, "I have a crush on Noel. Please tell me if she likes cheese," I would say, "Oh yes, let me tell you about this." And then the second, the second he was gone, I'd be like, "Noel, oh my God, guess what just happened?" Like there is no way I wouldn't tell you. Like that is a primary relationship. The best best friend relationship is a primary relationship, right? That is where the loyalty goes. And like, I get that there are people out there who like hold confidences, but I'm just going to tell you, like anybody out there who's got a crush on Noelle and wants to tell me about it, I'm going to tell her. Like, I'm just letting you know. I'm not going to keep your goddamn secret. I'm not going to hold on to your secret crush. You know, you're going to have to figure your shit out. Don't tell me. You don't want her to know. Um, So now all the people who have a crush on you are like, damn it. I was going to ask Lonnie if Noelle likes cheese. Um, <laughs> and we'll never know because I am we'll a mystery. Never know now. <laughs> My I food know. preferences will never come up Your food preference on this remain podcast. a mystery. Exactly. Um, so anyway, so this whole thing, like, I don't believe that nobody would tell her. I don't believe especially that Willow wouldn't tell her. So that to me, like both about Riley and Angel. Um, so that to me feels a little bit weird. Yeah. 
Yeah. We're like, we, we use a lot of weird plot speckle to get Angel into this right. narrative in a so that way that, that like. We get that reveal at the end, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is fantastic. But mm-hmm. also like. Seriously, like seriously, Angel, he's in Giles's house while they're yeah. getting while they're working out the logistics yeah. of Thanksgiving. What? Yeah. What? He's Angel. just hanging out in Giles' house. <laughs> and Giles isn't telling Buffy. Like that's all like that nobody is telling Buffy, I find to be just beyond beyond the comprehension. Like I don't like Giles I could see if he thought it was gonna keep Buffy safe, but I don't see how her knowing or not knowing the angel is there is keeping her safe. It's just it's basically a, a contrivance. It's a plot contrivance so that we can have the things that we want in this episode, you know, and then get what we get in over an angel when we do the crossover, um, with I will remember you, which go watch it now. It's so sad. <laughs> um <laughs> But anyway, you know, it's like Angel, you know, there are phones in Los Angeles. He could have called Giles and said, heads up, there's some kind of evil thing lurking that, you know, wants to kill Buffy. But instead he goes, he goes there because he wants to see her. So when he's complaining about, you know, I get the raw end of this deal because I have to be looking in on something I can't have. Like, yeah. shut up, Angel. You didn't have to. You could be back. This is not a finale fight. We're only on se- like episode seven, episode eight, you know, of this season. Yeah. So, um, um, we're really early. This is not a big bad, right? So whatever it is that's threatening her, you know, why the powers that be would give Doyle the vision, you know, that's whatever it is. It, it could be a phone call thing. You know, they're going to be much, much worse things that Buffy has to face that Angel is nowhere or near around for <laughs> because he's got his own show. So, um, so I don't know, like, I, I find that to be a little bit thin, but it is always fun. Like, it's fun to see David Boreanaz. It's fun to see Angel. I love Angel. It's just, it's just fun. I love the interaction between Willow and Giles where they t- they're they whispering about, oh, yeah, I saw him too. And then, yeah. Like, he's really lost his edge. <laughs> he's not, not very, very stealthy. stealthy. <laughs> he's not very stealthy. <laughs> It is very yeah. sweet. There's yeah. a lot of little sweet moments. It's very sweet. Um, so Xander, right? We don't get a lot of Xander in this episode. But what there is, I think, is really cute. I love, for some reason, every time he says syphilis, it cracks me up. <laughs> you know, well, he's the representative very... from syphilis says yay. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> he's very fixated on the syphilis. And, and oh, well, Willow yeah. is too. Because and, <laughs> what I love is Anya saying, well, it won't kill you. I mean, the smallpox right. will. The smallpox will kill like, you. It's not because because we're not actually concerned about death. We're concerned about male, you know, sexual virility purity and the pure sense sexual of sexual yeah, whatever. That's what of this disease is about. and all of that, which is yeah. very mm-hmm. very on brand for Xander. You it know, is like, absolutely Xander's like, first thought will always be of the penis. Yes, no, nothing can defeat the penis. Defeat the penis. <laughs> 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 oh god it's so cute he's very cute he's very cute though when he's sick and Anya is kind of not quite tending to him and he says mm-hmm. you're a very strange girlfriend you're <laughs> very strange <laughs> so girlfriend. great it is so, so sweet it's sweet. so sweet he's just like sweet. it's there's this moment of like he just gives up like he's yeah and then of course they show up at Giles's and he's got his arm around her partly because mm-hmm. he's Sick he can't stand. He right. can't really mm-hmm. stand. But they look like they look very coupley, and of course we've established them. Yes, in this episode, like as the couple that yes. comes to Thanksgiving and then ruins mm-hmm. it by and then- <laughs> working out their own relationship issues about one of them. You know, used to be a vengeance demon, and you don't talk to vengeance demons; you kill them. Right. I it's- didn't know you felt that way. <laughs> felt that way. And I mean, and this is this is my Anya. I love mm-hmm. this Anya. Oh, um, she's so cute! Right, right from the get go, when she's <laughs> she's standing there, when <laughs> Sandra's got his shovel, she's like, "I'm thinking about having sex with him right now." <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, it is so cute. Oh, Anya, Anya, but I love it. She says she's the the head anthropologist in charge is you know gonna symbolically turn over some mm-hmm. dirt or whatever. And Anya says, she's not rippling at all. I know. <laughs> I like the implication that a sufficiently yes. rippling person of any gender would be appealing to Anya, that her yes. sexual orientation is rippling. I just, I love it. I, I, 
I feel that. That's very, <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Um, and I love, I love Anya as the ex-demon who knows her diseases. Right. I was going to say smallpox. She's so excited. <laughs> so excited. She knows, man. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. she's a lot of experience with a lot of men with a lot of diseases and she knows, knows her stuff. Absolutely. Um, and I love, I mean, I love, I love a good fish out of water story. And of course yeah. that is what we get a lot with Anya. That's what Anya you know, is. Yeah. They go to, to Dean Guerrero's house and she says, I liked his wife. She gave me pie. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's so cute. And of course, Anya is the one who points out that Angel is like, he's, he's not a, (laughs) he's not a bad guy, but he's, he's a little bit, he's a little scary. He's intense. Yeah, he's he's intense. intense. Right. (laughs) Well, when, when Angel grabs Willow and she says, you're evil, you're evil, you're evil again. He's like, I'm not evil. I'm not evil evil for a long time. Yeah. And then Anya says, what's he like when he is evil? Right. (laughs) I was like. Okay, good point, you know? Like, All right, point yeah. well taken, absolutely. Yeah. No, Anya is is just a delight, pretty much almost universally, almost all the way through. The only times that I'm not delighted with Anya is usually because of the way that Xander is treating her. It's usually mm-hmm. not her, it's the way that she's being treated and, and the fact that just because Emma Caulfield can deliver any comic line doesn't mean that's all that you should give her to do, you know? Right. Um, and when she gets more, she does more with it. She's amazing. Um, so she's like one of my favorites and she's kind of coming in sort of in this truth teller role, right? She's the one who says everything and like, you know, points out the stuff that other people are too, you know, wrapped up in their their social game to like actually say. So I like that we've got that truth teller in Anya, but we've also got that in Spike who is coming in. Now this is where he is brought into the team, right? You know, Mm -hmm. like as the truth teller, as the resident Cordelia, you know, since we've (laughs) lost her to Angel. Um, So I love it. I love Spike as the little match girl looking through the dirty window at the vampires eating a victim with this yearning for family and connection and all of that. Like I freaking, I love, I love all of this with Spike. He just delights me. He is fantastic. I love him trying to charm his way back to Harmony. And of course it doesn't work (laughs) because Harmony has been doing a lot of reading. (laughs) And she has her own power now. That's right. I don't need you to complete me. Yep. Yep. (laughs) But I love the way that Buffy's interaction with Spike really mirrors the white guilt narrative that we've got going mm-hmm. on. You know, he, he comes to the door and he's all like, oh, I need help. I'm so, you know, I'm char broiling mm-hmm. outside because it's Southern California. And I, I, side note, I love the conceit that a vampire can just like wrap himself in a blankie and right. <laughs> like all's well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to use that a lot. <laughs> it's kind of great, but yeah. also like really guys, but yeah. whatever. Um but Buffy says to him, "So you haven't murdered anybody lately? Let's be best pals." Right. Like you know, and so and then on the other hand, we've got, you know, Xander being like, "Well, I didn't, you know, I didn't give him syphilis." They're right. all, "Well, I didn't kill anybody." And it's like, "Well, <laughs> you, you, okay, like you see what you're doing here." It's, right. You know, the the whole the whole Scooby Gang is like, "We don't have we didn't have anything to do with it." <laughs> Spike is just there like, "Come on, guys. Like, come on. Help I me know. out." I love it. I love it. I it love is Spike. So great. I love Spike. I, I mean, I just love Spike, but Spike doing his like, what is it? He's like, I'm, I've been neutered or I, right. Spike I've went been to neutered the, and Spike doesn't, Spike went doesn't to the vet. The yeah, Spike anymore. had a little trip to the vet and I'm like, oh God. <laughs> oh, Spike. And he's yes. trying to get well, Willow to side with him. Tell him what I did. Right. <laughs> she says, you said you were going to kill me and then kill Buffy. <laughs> Buffy. <laughs> right. But I couldn't do it, though. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's it's really incredibly sweet. And I love this, like, when Buffy ties him up and he's like, I'm not going to talk until I get fed. She just gives him this little, like, almost affectionate slap to the head. Right. It's so sweet and it feels like it really is very affectionate. And it's kind of funny establishing 
like the nature of this relationship was which was is essentially a camaraderie like there's something about the two of them that they just work so well together um but i think one of my favorite things though is spike's little speech about the the current state of the conflict well life didn't say it was right well you know how bad i feel about this okay it's eating me up a quarter cup of brandy and let it simmer but even though it's hard we have to end this Yes, he's been wronged, and I personally would be ready to apologize, but I... Oh, someone put a stake in me. You got a lot of volunteers in here. <laughs> I just can't take all this mamby-pamby boo-hooing about the bloody Indians. Uh, the preferred term is... You won, all right? You came in, and you killed them, and you took their land. That's what conquering nations do. That's what Caesar did, and he's not going around saying, I came, I conquered, I felt really bad about it. <laughs> The history of the world is not people making friends. You had better weapons, and you massacred them. End of story. Well, I think the Spaniards actually did a lot of... Not that I don't like Spaniards. Listen to you. How are you going to fight anyone with that attitude? You don't want to fight anyone. I just want to have Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, good luck. Well, if we could talk to him... You exterminated his race. What could you possibly say that would make him feel better? It's kill or be killed here. Take your bloody pick. Maybe it's the syphilis talking, but some of that made sense. <laughs> I made a lot of these points earlier, but you know, it's fine. No, uh, look, good. fine, okay, but someone still has to go warn the dean. I love Giles' little passive aggressive. This is fine, nobody listens to me. Yeah, and for some me. reason, yeah. every oh. time Xander brings up the syphilis, it cracks me up. It's just funny. It's yes. just funny. I know I know it's male penis obsession. I don't care. I think it's funny. Um so yeah, that whole thing, you know, and the thing is like really with Spike, like, you know, he's not wrong. You know, yeah, I mean, it's not, not comfortable. It doesn't accommodate our white guilt, you know, which reminds us that we are not bad people without us actually having to do anything. But the white guilt itself doesn't undo anything. It doesn't fix anything that was wrong. You can never fix it. You can't go back and unmurder these people like you just can't do it, you know. Um, so I find it really interesting, though, that later on we get Spike shouting, undo it, undo it about the bear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yep. I like kind of that that whole reflection there. And I think it's really fun. And of course, you know, it's Spike, who I'm always going to love, you know, <laughs> maybe because I have a colonized heart. I don't know. I got to look at it. I got to look at myself. I got to do a little interrogation of myself. But while I'm interrogating myself, which suddenly sounds dirty, but that's not how I mean it. Noel, what are you wearing? <laughs> well, at the groundbreaking ceremony, Buffy is wearing a cowboy hat in case mm -hmm. we didn't get it. You guys, I'm just like, I mean, yeah, I know, I know, I know you take a, you take a theme and you run with it, but I was like, really guys? Yeah. And of course, Willow has her peace sign sweater. Mm -hmm. We've got Willow as the, as the pacifist kind of mm -hmm. sort of, Willow's actually kind of the worst in this episode. We didn't talk about Willow, but she <laughs> is. <laughs> oh my God. Willow. I think, I think this is the most that I have disliked Willow, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I can but, understand that. Yeah. 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 But her, you know, she's very, it's very cute and very, um, I don't know, obvious that she's wearing mm -hmm. a big old, she's wearing a big old peace sign. And she's like, why mm -hmm. can't we all just get along and give back the land and have a conversation? And then, you know, but then, of course, she's perfectly happy to have turkey and pie with everyone else in their weird their okay. weird family tableau at the end. It's just, but anyway, anyway. Having Thanksgiving does not make you a bad person. Except Understanding that she was the history not into it at all. Like she was so, she was really disappointed in Buffy at the beginning when Buffy's like, "I still want to have Thanksgiving," and Willow's like, "Seriously." But yeah, like, but, but then I she talked it. to Buffy. She talked about, okay, yeah, I see it differently. I appreciate your perspective. I absolutely do, but I do see it differently. I see it that Buffy needs this normal thing, right? And this is a normal thing. And it is just turkey and pie and family. Like, it is about what Thanksgiving is about when you remove it from its very, very horrifying cultural context, which I agree with, along with Columbus Day, which is stupid, and I hate Columbus Day. Um, but nobody brings me pie on Columbus Day, so I'm less attached to it. Um, but I think that, like, Thanksgiving, what Thanksgiving has become 
you know, for us culturally is about that tradition, about the ritual, about the spending time with family, about connecting with family. So I don't think the people who celebrate Thanksgiving are bad people. I think that understanding on every other day of the year, aside from Columbus Day and Thanksgiving, where we get all up in ourselves, you know, about how terrible this is. And then we're not thinking about the missing and murdered indigenous women throughout the rest of the year. We're not thinking about what's going on with indigenous peoples and and the way that they are living, the struggles that they're having. We don't care, you know, at any other time. So for me, like having Thanksgiving isn't a problem. It's not carrying the other 364 days of the year that I think speaks more to like things that we can work on as a culture. But Willow, her, you know, her very strong philosophical stance against Thanksgiving and then participating in it, I think to me shows that she's willing to look past that because this is something that Buffy needs. Buffy needs just a day of normal. That's all she wants. And wanting to give that to Buffy and let Buffy have that, I think for me shows Willow stepping outside of her political, you know, um, feelings on this and looking at Buffy and saying, I love you. I will give you this thing that you want. So for me, I don't see that bad. I see where you're coming from, though. I do. I do absolutely see your perspective. It's just not where I read it. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Disagree to agree or however I know, but I love it. I love that we disagree. It's fun when we disagree because then I know that everybody out there has somebody making their argument for them on the show. And conversely, everybody out there has someone that they get to scream at in their car. But they get to be mad at. Right. Okay, focus on the one you agree with and stop yelling at us on Twitter. Okay, go ahead. You can yell at me on Twitter. I'm almost never there anymore because... She's almost never there. I'm I'm always there. there. Don't yell at me. I don't care. (laughs) Don't yell at me. I'm wrong. Whatever. Anyway. Um, All right. So, Noelle, what is your girl power moment of the week? My girl power moment of the week is harmony. I'm powerful and I'm beautiful and I don't need you to complete me and you're mean. (laughs) Which is great. And, of course, you know, the, the... Psycho theme from Psycho, reminiscent strings that we get, that mm-hmm. little light motif when Harmony threatens Spike with the stake, undercuts her excellent perspective just a little bit by, you know, casting right. her as the psycho girlfriend. But I still right. love it. And I love her planning to stake him because he staked her. And I love her kicking them, uh, kicking him out of their lair. I love it. I love I it. Love I love it. Harmony. Of love their Harmony. lair? Uh uh-uh. uh. That's her lair now. <laughs> <laughs> I love the whole thing. The whole thing. Harmony is fabulous. She's there for a, like a hot second, but I love every every single minute of it. Um, all right. So, Noelle, what's your favorite part? So, who's when he and Buffy are first fighting, says mm-hmm. you, she's she's got him, you know, she's got him. And yeah. he says, you slaughtered my people. Now you kill their spirit. This is a great day for you. And that <laughs> seems like... Like, there's a little bit of condescension in his voice, and I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, fair. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, absolutely. Yeah. He's totally sarcastic. This like, must be a great day for you. This is How did you feel Yeah, like, about congratulations yourself? to you. It's just, congratulations, white lady. It's right, exactly. Kind of, it's, it's kind of wonderful. And I learned it is. this morning mm-hmm. that that actor who plays Hoos is also the voice of Nighthawk in many of the Mortal Kombat games. So, you know. Wow, there you go. Like, yeah, so a little bit Have of uh, fun. uncomfortable indigenous <laughs> representation for you there. But he's got a great voice. He's got a great voice. He and when he comes voice. in with he has a very Keanu Reeves Hawk, kind of energy to him. Great. Yeah. He's great. <laughs> he's very cute. <laughs> okay. On that note, what is your favorite part of Pangs, Lonnie? Uh, Spike. Spike, <laughs> freshly neutered, the truth teller, becoming part of the team. Undo it, undo it. Like, I, I, all of it. Like, I love him you being made a part bear. of Thanksgiving. You made a bear. When he's getting shot with all the arrows while they're yes. hiding behind the couch. And, like, he's just, like, they're getting very close to the heart with that. They could have got him in any minute. It's just, it's so incredibly cute. And I just, I absolutely love it. It's always going to be Spike. What am I going to say? If Spike is in the episode, Spike is someone's favorite part. Pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. That's usually the way that it goes. 
you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, come find us on Twitter. Lonnie is at Lonnie Diane Rich, and I am at Noelle Aloud. And the hashtag is, as always, still pretty. This episode of Still Pretty was brought to you by the Chipperish Media producers who support us on Patreon at the power producer level. These people are the reason why Still Pretty is coming to you free and ad free right now. So thank you to our September producers, Kevin. West, Shelly, Abigail, Kristen, Noel, thank you, Noel, Deborah, Jonathan, <laughs> Alyssa, Alice, Erica, Sarah, and Heather. And this week's special message for our power producers there are some great spells that work much better with an ear in the mix. To find out how you too can support Chipperish Media, visit patreon.com slash chipperish. And other ways to show your support, write a great review on Apple Podcasts, tell your friends about the show, or tell Spike that you're powerful, you're beautiful, and you don't need him to complete you. Also, he's mean. <laughs> we will be back next time with Something Blue, the Yay! ninth episode of season four. I Yay! can't wait. So good. Until then, to commemorate a past event, you kill and eat an animal. It's a ritual sacrifice with pie. <laughs>